Mr. Williams holes. And now you've given me a negative for the second in that'll make it even shorter, won't it? And um, I, well, they say it's not a race at all, the 140, is it? Where they've got um, Whipper's Delight and Joker Jack in the race. Um, yeah. Um, there we go, yeah, OK. Now, just uh, one quickie, John. Um, Catrick, Wolverhampton, any news? I should be betting on the aways at Catrick and Wolverhampton today. What race, please, John? You can pull yourself together, it's early in the morning. Well, the Wolverhampton card... Yeah. OK. In the 220, Dancing Cavalier. Let's have a look quick there. 220, Dancing Cavalier. It looks, looks, looks like belly to belly on the card, but anyway. Evens. But anyway, that's a double star nap, Dancing Cavalier, in the 220 at Wolver. Thank you, John Bates. Thanks very much. I'll speak to you later, mate. I'll probably get an update from the course from you if anything happens. Follow that page, 314, on the racing channel. We'll see any movers for me, will ya? See you later. Bye. Right, let's go back to... Yeah, well, I've got, um, I've got my mobile and um, I've got a little earpiece, so I can sit there and um, chat and chat and chat and Phil has to sit next door and he has the tissues in front of him and I say, go to the 220 at Wolverhampton and he changes the prices there and whatever. So all during the course of the journey it happens. And finally, after I've been had my pitch at, um, settled at Plumpton today, then I will ring round all my contacts once again and say, give us the final update everywhere, and then I'll go to war with the enemy from there on in. Uh, Phil, of course, is the, is the clerk that you um, mentioned on TV one morning was sick, wasn't it? And anybody want to earn a bottle? Oh, yeah, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Turn up the new market. <laughs> yeah, Phil. He actually turned up, didn't he? And he said, well, he's, I don't know how much I was earning. I'm not going to be Yeah, he's a... His um, daughter gave birth very early in the morning and it was his first grandchild and he said he wasn't sure what time, if it was born, whether he'd be there or not, could have been with his wife, who was excited. But anyway, so um, it was more of a laugh than anything. I said, look, me, me, um, Clark can't come, the light and dark can't come yes, today. Right. Anybody want to earn a bottle, turn up because Phil can't come. I went on suddenly the phone next, it was Phil, he said, I'm coming, I'm coming. He said, I didn't know I was going to get 200 pounds a day. The worst part was, I had about 10 phone calls. They said, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. I won't play that game again. <laughs> 200 pounds a day's work. <laughs> right, one twelve forty. let's carry on. Five to one. He made that a double careful, well, didn't he? 25 to 1, 10, 1, 2, 20, 14, 6, 9, 2, must ring BB, see what he knows, um, 6, 4, 1, oh, 1, 2, 1, 10, 4, 6, 8 to 13, 1, 14. Hi, good morning, it's Barry Dennis. Um, what, what do we know today, please, at uh, Plumpton particularly, but I'm also going to be betting at Carrick and Wolverhampton. No, no, he, um, he's not here. Right. I've had a... Um, yes, I've had a negative for the second in there, Polar Flights Race. Uh, perhaps now, uh, ear roll on, Polar Flight. Yeah. The, the big firms are betting on the 240 race, OK. Hang on, um, Catterick, which race, please? The 2 o'clock at Catterick. Number 16, Celtic Duke. 8 to 1 over into what? Ching, half a stretch? Ch uh, Ching and Mez, I'll put that on there oh, for the card, yeah. Nothing at Wolver so far. The 250 non runner. Huntswood 250 a non runner. 220, 250 number. What number is that, Bell? Number four. Huntswood a non runner in the 250. That's the only non runner so far. Okay, mate, well, I'll give you. Uh, can I give you a call up just when I get the races later on and give an update? Cheers, mate. Bye. Okay, don't think. Um, 
I've got one positive for Polar Flight and a negative for the second inning in that race at um, Plumpton today, so Polar Flight could um, will be a lot shorter than is anticipated on the tissue. Um, back over to here, 12.40, 1.40, 1.40, 10.11, 6.4, 4.1, 100.1 to one Joker Jack. Think that's the right price, Dave? 100.1 to one Joker Jack? I'll put another naught on it, shall I? <laughs> Get around, of course, oh, all right, then, yeah. It might not sound so clever, then, might it? The 210 race, 9 to 2. Uh, they show 8 to 11 polar flight. I'm going to make that spear roll on for a while because of the other stories. 100 to 1 colour counsellor, 20 to 1 Fox Ridge. People at home, of course, wouldn't know what the thing you were talking about with all this race course talking rope. And Chicken and uh, well, it's, it's, it is deliberate, it isn't deliberate, it's just that it becomes so commonplace, the jargon now, that even when I'm talking to myself, I say chicken and instead of five and a half to one. Um, so uh, it's not deliberate for any reason other than the fact that at the races, it was this silly old um, idea from 50 years ago that the punters shouldn't know what the bookmakers are doing and what sort of prices they're relaying to each other, and so they invented all these different languages. There's um, lots of them, but the, the common one is um, bottle and bottle and half carpet, carpet and half rope, rope and half ching, ching and half half stretch, and Nevis TH, and that's just back slang, and it's so. Most of them are backwards, aren't they? Most of them are sort of back Some are also down around prison terms, aren't they? Yeah, well, carpet is supposed to be three years in jail or something, wasn't it? Right. I don't know, and you got. I don't know what the. Hey, listen, I haven't been in jail yet, but I don't know what I don't know what the three years in jail is I mean, significant. If you've got Twelve months it was a stretch. Yeah. Twelve was a stretch. Yeah. Six is half a stretch. Yeah. We get those bits, but um, I'm, I've just adopted them like everybody else did. I've only been in the game a short time, David. I started in 1970 on race courses and 1961 in betting shops, and um, betting shops have never heard of these terms, have they? Uh, 1960. But once I got the race course in 1970, suddenly. Everybody's using them. I didn't know what they were talking about for the first two years. I had to pick it up myself, but now it just becomes commonplace. 33, 100. Rove Supreme, we put a plus against that. There's some negatives there. The 240, 25, bottle and half. What's that, lightning lad? 100 away. Carp and half, Courtney Nero. Elifavir, Cardinal Rule, and Rove and half. Scavo. Just two races to go. Carbon half young thruster, Chingham is one for Willie, 107, double carpet, pony, double carpet, on the head, they on, 50, 100, 100. And the last race, eight ticket is, but got a negative, Nevis a Rofe, Carbon half, Rofe, Ching, TH. Right, that's the tissue done for Plumpton. And there's the tissue we'll take for the other away meetings I should possibly bet on. The trick now is to start getting ourselves prepared to leave and off to plumps. But you never know the good the racing crowd you can't ever tell. Obviously flat it has to be sunny and warm for a flat foot to come out, but the jump people they come out in all weathers don't yes, they? Yeah, so yeah, that's true, yeah. Um, um, so I'll just jump, drop this round and we'll go through the turnstile, okay young man? Got it. Yeah. I've just got my gear through because I can't get it through the turnstile. No, no, straight that's back, boys. That's 27. Yeah, race. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Two, three. That's half the battle, though, Barry. Your expenses you've got to pay to get into the track and everything, isn't it? I mean, so people, people are under the illusion the bookmakers and their staff get in free, but the truth is we have to pay the same as the punters to get through everywhere. Do you pay five times the entrance fee to bet. And we pay five times the entrance fee to bet on top of that, and plus the petrol expenses and the staff expenses, and, and you know, it comes to quite a decent. So you've got to win a fair bit in yeah, a week I before you actually to, make a living. Uh, my expenses roughly are. Three hundred pounds a day. He's calling out what wages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my expenses are roughly three hundred pounds a day, 
and so if I go out five times a week, I've got to win £1,500 just to break level. Yeah. So um, it depends what the turnover is. And if there's a good turnover, obviously I wouldn't be in the game, would I, unless I was going to survive, unless I couldn't do that. But there's plenty of weeks, of the disappointing weeks, when you break level or lose, or break level or lose, and the expenses pile up and you're starting to get the needle about the game, aren't you? <laughs> you think that. But um, they've even stopped, under the new system, us bookmakers buying members' badges which uh, obviously gets in cheaper. They don't want bookmakers and staff owning members' badges because they realise that we attend every day. And it saves us hundreds of pounds, it saves me particularly hundreds of pounds a year by owning a member's badge, doesn't it? All your staff have got to be registered as well now, haven't Yeah, we always be registered and pay a fee for them to be registered. But, um, the, the, you know, the, let's take Lingfield badge, for instance, a hundred, absolute marvellous value, £160, and you get 88 meetings yeah. for £160 if you pay before the 1st of December. But, um, no, you can't do that. Now, the, the proposal is that all staff have to have um, a... ID card. ID card and a receipt of purchase of coming through the turnstile. All staff. And so, therefore, the, there's no good in having badges. So, um, generally, all the way around, that we no longer will bookmakers be able to... Well, it's not be, won't be viable to buy um, the yeah, so badges. For, so, for a good day today, then? Well, Dave, with the breakfast and the petrol and the inns, we're already doing about 100 quid, so we've got to start going. <laughs> hang on, hang on. It's been years ago. I can't hear my name called out here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, we're down to me, are we? Who's your next? Where, where, where is available, please? Uh, pardon? One or two in the front. Well, the other end. Um, is the pitch to the other side of Mr Lane available? Yes, no. yes. No. Come on, they're near Barry. Kathy's taking that. There's one the other side of that. Which is too that's, that's too far down, isn't it? I'll go... You see where I put my tools already in the back row? Yes. Yeah. I'll stay there. Thank you very much. Uh -oh. He's got the camera. Because he's behind so... You're very polite this morning, Mr Dennis. What's happening to you? You got out of the bed the right side. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in, I'm in the back row in the middle there, OK? Thank you. So why are you staying there, then, Barry? You can put, you can put a picture on the front row. Well, uh, the picture on the front row is up the other end there, and generally the... Um, the public that come through the gangway there, they all <laughs> congregate in those breakfast yeah, shops yeah, and then yeah. bars underneath there. And anybody that comes in from there has to come in through that bottom um, entrance exit of members, don't they? So where's, where's, the, num where's the number one pitch here then? Number one pitch here would be by well, this the best open... pitch to be in is this oh, where Ronnie, Bolton, Ronnie Bolton has gone. And correspondingly, the second best pitch is here, and the third best pitch is here, and then the one the other side is quite good, OK? But then gradually, as you move down further along, the front row, you're getting further away from the general public that come through the gap between the two stands. So, so you're thinking it'd be better today, Bob? Well, I might as well be in, behind, although I'm behind pitch. these, I also intend betting at um, Catrick and Wolverhampton, don't I? And the betting shop is just through there, and the public has come back to there, so they find easier um, access to me there than they will right up the other end of the front line. And um, when there's a small crowd, the number one up there, it's um, there's not, there's not many people going in. It's an hour before the first race, there isn't many people here. I mean, no. it's like going to be a small crowd. Though sometimes they come out of the ground at the last yeah, minute. Yeah, it's a possibility, but we've always found that this meeting isn't on the calendar. And whenever a meeting isn't on the calendar, for some unknown reason, it's not very, very, very well attended. I don't know why, but uh, this was swapped with Fontwell, I believe. Originally, it was supposed to be in Fontwell. So, um, over the years of experience, we've found that meetings like that, that are sudden changes in the calendar, don't um, bring, big, big, bring big crowds. But whether or not that happens, I'm not sure. But I prefer not to take a chance of going down there in number one, away from the action, as opposed to being up here where most of the public is probably congregate. Now, how many more calls have you had on the phone on the way down to the car? I had three calls on the coming down. And, um, what I've done with tissue, with tissue, oh, here's my tissue. <laughs> Whilst during the journey we've transferred all prices for all um, Patrick and Wolverhampton over as well. And the one call was just confirming that Cavaliero was um, strongly fancied. Another call gave us a new line that Belmont 
Uh, Milmont, not Milmont, Milman. He's fetching the 340 under confirmation that ticket is gift. Probably will need another couple of runs before it's at its best. Um, so that might no, will, drift. Will, will all bookmakers here today get that information? Have they all got the same connections, or is it just no. you that's got no, I don't know. Most bookmakers have got. Yes. I mean, you're all, you're all looking at each other all the time. We're all looking anyway, aren't you? But, um, what happens is this? Once upon a time, if I was getting um, a big trainer's um, information, or they thought I was getting a big trainer's information, all eyes would be on me, what I was doing on that particular race. And um, because of my one of my best friends is David Johnson, the leading owner of jumps, they have some reason to believe that every time a David Johnson horse runs, what's Barry Dennis doing with the David Johnson horse? But I'm quite trivial with Martin Pike. They all run on their merit and they're all there to win. And so they've all got the chance they re represent. But the bookmakers tend to believe that I would have in inside information about certain stables. And um, is this inside information or not? I don't know because I watch the racing channel on my days off. And on my days off, the trainers are interviewed, the owners, the connections are all interviewed, and very informative the interviews are, aren't they, David? Um, oh, yes. Yesterday, or the day before, I was watching Folkestone, and the trainer of um, It's All Right Fred, or It'll Be All Right Fred. Right, said Fred. Right, said Fred. That was the one. She came on, and um, she said, My horse is very, very well. It'll go extremely well. I'm very confident. It went from 5 to 4 to 11 to 4 in the market, and um, I can't remember the name of the uh, rider, the owner, I believe. Um, he's not the best jockey in the world, tell him if you're watching, but he, um, he won it, led all the way virtually, and won. Yet the horse went from five to... Yet the information direct from the trainer's lips, five minutes before the off on the racing channel, was, my horse will go very well, and I expect it to win. And so it doesn't always reflect in the market, does it? You did a game, obviously, Barry, is to try and get every horse in the race in the book, isn't it? I mean, when I was in the ring 20 years ago, there was a possibility of doing that, but not anymore, no, it No, no, that's an absolute impossibility. Let me give you a simple example, Dave. Supposing there's a... We'll pick a race out today, shall we? There's a four-runner race. Cavaliero's race. Cavaliero's race. Where, um, Joker Jack, as you suggested back home a couple of hours ago, ought to be a thousand to one. Yes. Well, it will be unlayable anyway, Joker Jack. It doesn't represent any percentage in the market at all, does it? No. Even if a hundred to one, it only represents one percent right. if it was layable. Ten to eleven, six to four. Well, basically, I won't be able to lay anything outside them front two. And if I laid them at those prices alone, I'd be over broke, wouldn't right. I? 10 yes. to 11, 6 to 4. So I don't know what's going to happen later on, but let's presume a, perhaps a regular client of mine comes up and bets an 1,100 or 1,100 on Cavaliero, mm. and I will then take it out and go 4 to 5. Other people start going 7 of all, 2 to 1, and I haven't got any room. I, I, I'm now stuck with the bet. I had someone bet 1,100 or 1,100 on, and that will probably be the book if that occurs. I yes. won't lay another horse in the race and hope that the punter happens to be wrong. Um, you can't lay all horses, and uh, simpler, a simpler example I could come for um, the inexperience is if there was a three-runner race and they went evens, evens, 12 to 1, and I laid an even £1,000, one of them, that would immediately go to four to five. The other one would go to five to four against, and the, uh, the remaining horse would be a 20, 25 to one chance. Well, the logic there is I can't lay evens five to four and 25 to one in a three-runner race. Because yeah, you're over broke. Because I'm over broke. So consequently, I'm stuck with the bet. Once I've laid the but even thousand pound, I'm stuck with it. To people watching at home who don't understand how, how you make a book, it's all done around percentages, isn't it? In everything, theory, is everything over 100% in theory, you would keep. Should be profit, yes. Providing if you've laid every horse to a certain amount. Now, you, your book there on that four horse race comes to about, what, 116%? At it? the moment, it shows 116% to right. kick off with. That's right. Yes. That's on, on those prices. So if you laid every horse to a certain amount at that percentage, you would win 16%. Um, Nearly, Dave, but we'll, we'll agree. Theory. In the theory of 116%, yes. 116% being the whole, every £116 I took, I would pay out £100, yes? So if 116% is the whole, I would win about 12% or 12.5%, yes. OK? Yeah. So, yes, in theory, yes. But the problem being that once one bet is struck on one of them horses, the others drift alarmingly supply and demand, isn't it? in a weak market and the, the theory goes out of the window. So now, 
you can either stand the horse that is being backed either by the offices or the public yes. and play one against one or you can attempt to lay the other horses regardless of any price and it's possible and frequently happens now that we bet to 98 99 percent because of the fact that the volume of money is for only one horse and so the bookmakers um, stretch the others in an attempt to field some money against that and it's not there. Do you find now because of the weakness of the market you tend to become a punter as well as a bookmaker on certain races? This is a term often people apply to me. I'm not a punter in any way shape or form but what does happen is this that if they was a two horse race and they was going evens each and I laid an even thousand pound I would never lay another bet. That's the end of it. Because if I couldn't lay evens the other one which is no percentage at all I wouldn't play. So if you think that I stand one horse for a lot of money and don't lay the others, that makes me a punter. Yes, OK, in that I'm like, I am a punter. In the weakness of the market that there is in certain um, fixtures in this country now, uh, it does seem to favour off-course um, outlets who can send money back and, and shorten the price of a horse to cut their liabilities off-course. Yes, I agree there as well. I have some um, big business accounts that quite legally ring me up on course and um, Asked me to send me to the big three. Uh, asked me to put two thousand or four thousand pound on a horse, and which, I could, which would significantly cut the cut the price I, of the market in a weak market. Anyway. With in a weak market, I could reduce a horse from seven or four to evens at most places with four thousand pound. Mm. And that could cut uh, an off-course liability by up to well, 50%. I've said this before, so, um, I don't think there are 10,000 betting shops anymore. Let's presume there are 10,000 betting shops. And if each betting shop had um, £100 on the favourite in their shop, um, 10,000 times 100, does that come to a million? Well, yeah, it does, yeah. And so if I reduce that from seven to four to evens with four thousand pound instead of laying seven to four to a million pound you lay evens to a million pound and so there is a weakness but hopefully with this new um, purchase scheme there'll be stronger bookmakers coming into the ring and um, the market will be a lot stronger do you see that going a significant way i mean there are a lot of pitches up for sale it would appear all over the country yeah there are lots of pitches up for sale people have got um uh, would then, you see yourself buying pitches or selling some of yours? Uh, I have spent a long time thinking and I haven't fully decided. I'm coming up 59 years old, been 30 odd years in this game and not progressed in the back row, so I would have liked the opportunity to have bought pitches and gone forward. But uh, 59. There's only certain pitches that are worth buying, really, though, aren't they? Precisely. Yeah. That, um, an example I could perhaps give that pitch number five might become available pick. This is a new system, not pitch. Pick number five would become available at Newmarket Rowley Mile. And then the next one available after that is pick number 14. Well, pick number 14 on off days is no better than my pick number 32, which probably stands side by side. So what point in me buying pick number 14 um, for 90% of the days at Newmarket Rowley Mile? It's no great improvement on the pos present position I'm in. So... Um, pick number five would probably come to a lot of money, though, at most places. Phil, you're Barry's long-standing clerk. How do you long stand Long-standing or suffering. Like, I was going to say long-suffering. Suffering, yes, yes, suffering. But you've been with him a long time, haven't you? Um, yes, ten years uh, out on the race course, but we worked 30-odd years ago. You're pretty quick at the book. Shops. We've watched you do it. I mean, when the new computerised system comes in, as it's going to in the near future, do you think that would be quicker than the, the recognised clerk as it is now? Um... Depending, it's probably better that the fact that it, or easier that the fact the figures are all there for you basically once you punch that in. But um, we've got reservations really with the tickets coming out. You know that uh, it doesn't matter how fast you punch those keys, the tickets seem to dwell. You know, like it's a, a delay before that comes out of the machine. So um, I mean, with Barry cracks away probably faster than anybody. Yeah, with a good clerk like yourself, you could probably take a lot more bets in that time. We, the time yes, to come you know, like, there are instances. We had a couple last week of races where he's rattled off, and like, we both said, well, a computer wouldn't have handled it. You know, um, uh, didn't they have uh, had a test? Didn't they man against the machine somewhere? And, and um, well, I don't know if they've had one. I mean, I Barry they did. Someone, uh, someone. I think the man came out on top. Go, right yeah. I mean, I would back myself to get the bets in the book. Quicker than if it's a power uh, failure, it could be a problem as well. Of course, yeah, you've got yeah. that. I mean, we've had instances where it's um, 
the scene where it's poured down with rain during an afternoon and they have to pack up, you know. Or whether they'll overcome that with covers or um, better technology, we don't know. You know, obviously the printers, since they first started, the printers have got better um, since, uh, I think, like John Lovell was the first one out, and that seemed desperately slow, you know, but... Um, they do seem to be improving, but as I say, whether they can cope with the way he rattles bets off, yes. I don't know. But obviously, at the end of it, if, if you can get them on and get the tickets out, it probably is better, you know, because the figures are all done for you. You know exactly how you're betting, exactly what every horse loses. Um, yeah, it probably is better, but whether it's fast enough or whether he gets a rush, I don't know. It'll still be a job for a clock, though, won't it? Somebody's got to oh, someone's got to punch the, the computer, yes. yes yeah. Um, Probably, uh, clerks like myself, you get a certain, obviously a certain oh, amount of hey, job hey, satisfaction, you feel you've got certain hey, skills and hey, that. Well, hey, punching hey, a computer hey, key hey, doesn't hey, really hey, seem that you're um, yeah, no, using you your mean. experience or mm. limitations or whatever, you know. It's, uh, can you just, can you just show us your book so yeah, we can sure. just, before they disappear totally? This is a race uh, at Newmarket back in October. Um, so we've got a, uh, oh, that was a big day, was it a day Lamy? Um, yeah, yes. quite a big race. This is a day Lamy race, yeah. Um, we finished up with, with fielding 4,600 pounds. That's your field money? Yeah, we just, paid that Just to run pounds. down the day Lamy column, on the, the left there is, is your liability. This is the actual takeout, yes. yes. You have um, your bets here. Um, it's a little weight at this stage, 110 yeah. to 80, 55 to 40. The ticket, ticket number, number the there. Um, this is the field out running of total. each horse. Yeah. yeah. And this is the takeout of each horse. Well, you can see, in the end, we were holding on the win book 4,200 pounds. Dale Army took out 6,000 pounds. That was a loser for two grand. That was a loser for 1,800 pound. Yeah. Um, Basically, that looks about the only loser we had on the race. Uh, this wins is 600 quid, this wins 1,100 pounds. Not a bad book, really. Like, and you can tell um, at an instant whether it's a winner or a loser, but yeah, of course, by comparing this, your um, money with you, we take out yeah, money. Yeah, I mean, immediately at the, at the off, sometimes you haven't obviously got all this out because like, you've had a rush at the off, yes. you know, but uh, Do you a find, few seconds I mean, afterwards, you know. Obviously, Barry wants you to tell him what his liabilities are as you're going along. And when the race is off, he also wants to know what a bogey is, wasn't it? Um, largely, yes, but he does have a very good idea himself anyway. I mean, if I went to sleep, he would still know, you know. Yes. Um, a lot of them are, uh, need to know a lot more than Barry does. He does have a very good Tell idea of how you're going and, you know, what's for what, you know, without me telling him. He doesn't really often ask a lot anyway. Um, a few clerks that have stood in for him at times have sort of said, well, this is for science, only tells him to shut up. You know, yes. like, don't talk to me, don't yeah. tell me anything, got I don't it. want to know, because he's got it basically, to an extent, in his head, you know. Mm. So, um... That looks a good day. I don't think today is going to be as busy as that. Um, I doubt it, no. We might take that many bets on the day. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Hello, Barry Dennis. Right, um, let's go through Plumpton quick, can we? 12.40 Plumpton, anything? Nothing happening. 110 Plumpton. Odds on native, 38 on. OK, 140. You've got 8 to 11, not 10 to 11 now, Cavaliero. 8 to 11 now, Cavaliero, not 10 to 11, yeah. Uh, two, 4 to 6 Polar Flight, yeah. Supreme Day. 5 bar 1 now, that's 5 to 1 now, Supreme Day, yeah. 5 five Polar. Cardinal Rule into 6 to 4. That's 11 of all early morning. 7 of all, sorry, yeah. 6 to 4 Cardinal Rule, yeah. Yeah. Bowls patrol. Yeah, I've got six to four only anyway. Yeah. Nothing open for us race. Phil, go just take that for me, please. Well, can we go over to the Rowlandson's Charm, £20 a five, ticket number 81. Chicken change, thank you. Tell them multi franchise. Multi franchise, £45 a 1082, thank you. Alex, four to one of Hill, nine to two bar. Eight treasure dome, five inclination. Which one? Yes, sir. Multi franchise, £45 a 10, ticket number 883, thank you. Inclination, 50 pound of 10. Team number 884, thank you. 
Travelling then over two miles in a furlong, the Brighton novice is claiming her and the Russian River over on the inside got a good start. Effort on the hill, limit the damage over on the far side. He's sticking to his guns very bravely. Treasure Dome is trying very hard as they race on towards the line, but limit the damage is too good. Toasted, oh, I ain't toasted. 125 off five each way, 51. Bold, don't be caught under a five, don't you, Sil? There's six dogs in poser. Six dogs in poser. Take forever 25 pound of five. That's forever. Think I'm a nine over three. Let's leave up. I like three to one bar one. Eight to one bar one or two. Of the uh, backline bookmakers, Barry Dennis is uh, one of the most aggressive and accommodating. And to to my sort of uh, stakes, uh, I, I very rarely have a problem. He, he should be, uh, you know, much further up the uh, rankings compared to some of the uh, uh, fellows on the front line who, uh, who would systematically halve the bets. You know, and I'm not talking to massive amounts. You know. I'm not a big punter. I'm a regular punter. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's Barry is an example of a, a bookmaker who's probably in the wrong position. You can certainly hear him anywhere in the ring, oh, can't yeah. you? He, yeah, he's a bully character. Yeah, he certainly advertises his prices. You know what? Uh, you know the horses he wants to lay. Um, but that's fair enough. Why can't we have charismatic bookmakers making the game what it should be? You know, you know, it, it's no secret that there's, there's dead wood in the wrestling ring. Staying on pretty well. That was over the second last. Fountain Bit is still there as well for the miners. Mill Mount, the one to catch then as she races on up the hill towards the final flight. The far side, keep me in mind the yellow jacket. The near side ticket is given Fountain Bit. One flight left to take and Mill Mount is over. By about six or seven lengths then from Tickety's Gift who moves into second place and racing inside the closing stages all the way for Mill Mount here and Brendan Powell. They win. <laughs> I'll carry this all on my own, OK? Barry, back home again now. You went uh, into the track full of optimism and come out rather dejected. Yeah, it was a... Um, well, this game is up and down, and it, Dave? It's, um, it's depressing when you lose, especially on a day like today when even you'll admit it was... Um, Tight as cold, wasn't it? It was well, absolutely I mean, it was bitter. Coldest day of the year so far. Coldest day I've known all year, and the the crowd was low. And I mentioned earlier on, it was a transferred meeting. It was on the calendar as Font Morgan. And whenever meetings are transferred, we never seem to get an attendance. And um, the crowd was low. The money was poorish, but um, you have to take the good with the bad. And sometimes you can turn up like that, and it could be a good day. So I, I, tend, I tend to look at it. It's my living. And so I need to go out every day, regardless of the weather condition and um, whether it's going to be good or bad. You started off in the first, well, not a bad race, limit the damage one, which you yeah. laid a little bit uh, yeah. to. One. We was winning early. Um, we got to £979 in front on the Plumpton meeting and to £787 in front on the away's Catrick and Wolverhampton. So, some stage during the middle of the afternoon, we was winning 1,800 quid. So how were you doing after the first race when you made the damage one? Um, yeah, we was winning three or 400 pound after the first one, and then... we Maybe Charlie won the second race. I yeah, mean, we that was a Skinner for you, wasn't it? It was a Skinner for 347 quid because... Skinner being you didn't lay the winner. I didn't lay the winner because, as you'd probably heard about all day, I was told that there was a horse in the race I ought to get on with, and I knocked that out to five to one, and the favourite would have been seven of all on, but... I mean, it didn't happen that way, did it? And I've got no control over what other bookmakers want to do, and that favourite went off. It didn't go for evens, but there was evens available quite often. And um, in the end, 
as I tried to explain about betting margins. There was no betting margin left for me to do, and so I just had to go the way I felt, and um, I was with the favourite. The favourite was a Skinner, and fortunately that duly won by a distance. This filly, this mare, I should say, native charm, in a different league at this stage. You've got one fence left to jump, coming up towards it now, and as with all the others, absolutely no problem. A fine round of jumping here by native charm. I think she deserves a round of applause, don't you, as they race on up towards the hill. A very, very easy win then for a classy mare. Native Charm and June McCarthy win. We got into the third race, it looked Joker Jack, we already said, couldn't possibly win. Yeah, it we... did look a two-horse race, but in the end it turned out to be a three-horse race. Yeah, and um, we haven't been too bad there. Um, you probably, on the camera, you got me laying 11 or 10 on one of them, seven of all or another. And Cavalier and Woodlands Bow. Yeah, yeah. and... Um, Five to one and nine to two, the winner. So even those three alone, without Joker Jack, comes out 106, 107 percent, and um, I won 602 pound on that race without any big liabilities on the race. So you still think things are going all right until you came to the fourth race, where you laid far less hassle. Well, quite lovely, I, didn't you? I, yeah, I laid far less. I laid a 1600 to four in one bet and um, some other 10, 20, 30 pound bets at four to one, and. The horse I was told there, the Nicholson horse that would be a drifter, I can't recall that. Would you remember that was called though? Supreme Day. Supreme Day went from three to one to seven to one. And it was difficult to lay, and so I was reluctant to be heavy into the favourite. But other bookmakers laid four to five for the favourite early. Polar Mist, I think it was called. Wasn't yeah. It? And um, I missed the boat somewhere somewhat that I didn't let them bet seven of all on when I could have done. They would have bet me seven of all on. But I was looking to get the third in and other runners before I laid the favourite in on that occasion. So finally, I had a, a some amount, small amount of odds on bet on and laid some other horses. But um, I finished up losing 360 odd pound when the far less hassle won the race. You knew you fade a long way out though, there, was that? Yeah. It was going so well, wasn't it? Down the back it went clear and um, it, the, they kept kidding me the favourite was travelling easily on the bit 10 lengths behind, but I assumed it was travelling easy on the bit one length behind and 10 lengths behind, and so finally they didn't have the turn of foot and the winner won quite comfortably, didn't it? And over in good style. He's run them off their feet here. Polar Flight has had no answer. He's trying hard on the run in, but far less hassle has got far too much firepower for them this afternoon. Goes on to score all the way success in the hands of Timmy Murphy, Polar Flight in second place. What about the race after that, the uh, two mile five handicap chase, which Scarbo won? Um, Scarbo, I had a skinner for it, but I only took 600 pounds because I'd been involved in betting on a race across the card, either at Catrick or Wolverhampton that was running late, and I hadn't joined in the Plumpton betting until late, so, um, and the favorite drifted um, there. He went from six to four out to two to one. And um, in the end, I didn't feel a lot of money, 600 quid on the race, and um, I had a skinner, you know, so that was probably, it was at that stage that we was getting nearly a thousand pound at Plumpton, and best part of 800 quid on the away, so we was winning 800, 1800 pound. It was after the fifth race that, that I said to you that do you ever feel like you should go now, take the profit and not bet on the last two races? And Thanks very much for reminding yeah. me, Dave. Yes, that's exactly what you did say. Mm. You said if you're ever a couple of grand in front, do you feel like going home then when it's a freezing cold day? But I deliberately stayed because you wanted me to go home because you were freezing <laughs> cold. No, the truth is that um, I paid my expenses for the day, I paid the staff wages for the day and all that, and so I feel this way that... There's two races to go. What difference the last two races at Plumpton and the first two races tomorrow at Windsor? Um, it doesn't make much difference to me which of them two races I'm going to bet on, does it? But bookmaker is betting in front of you. Chris Lane decided to do just that. Yeah, go home. That. that allowed you to change your pitch. You started taking a lot more bets because you had a, a more prominent position, but it didn't really work out how you thought it would. No, it was unfortunate, but then that, once again I feel that is the luck of the draw. Suddenly I was given a much better pitch because uh, senior bookmakers and we left and went home and my turnover then increased dramatically. I took £2,855 on the next race but the favourite was back from nine of all into seven of all by um, Ladbrokes and other offices and um, I lost £2,000 on the race so the whole day's winnings all went in one race but I felt I had the value when I was suddenly I was holding a lot more money in the field book and the business was a lot better because I'd moved up into a front-line pitch. They just left the last race. You were told early morning uh, that Millmount was 
a relatively good thing. Yes. Now, did that sway you though in the way you bet on the last race? Um, I always take notice of what people, when my information is comes through, but. When it reduces to a price, I fell out to lay. Like this mill man had been seven to two earlier on, and three to one, and I hadn't laid any money. I didn't take any money for it at all at that price. But then when it reduced to five to two, I thought now's the time I ought to start getting involved. And um, I laid an eight hundred pound bet in one hand that done two grand. Um, but I didn't have. I, I'm not complaining about the book I had in the last because I've laid seven of all the favourite and five to two the second in, and um, that somewhere come out about seven of all on the two horses coupled and there was two at six to one and two at twelve to one and the, the margin was there it was about 108 percent it's just the wrong result unfortunately so from mid-afternoon when we was winning 2000 we moved into a better pitch and we went out with our towels between our legs we finished up doing 892 pound on the day before expenses Mm. And now, of course, we're looking what's just after six o'clock now, and you'll be looking obviously at tomorrow's card because you're going to bet at Windsor yeah. tomorrow as well. You're going to go through the I whole dropped, process again. I dropped Philip off um, ten minutes ago at his house, and there's a news agent next door. I said, run in and get me an evening standard, please, with tomorrow's props in, will you? And he came out with that, and as we said, good night. I'm in here now. Directly, you finished um, filming. The internet will go on. See if the racing post is up yet with tomorrow's runners. The um, standard I'll be studying that and the runners and there's a football match on tonight I'll do all those three things bit of dinner bed about 11 o'clock and up half past six in the morning the circus goes on we move on to Windsor tomorrow do you ever feel like enough's enough you want to put your feet up carpet slippers or that sort of thing yes I do feel like that and after about two days the wife runs out screaming so I have to go back to work she can't stand me in here all day every day well, let's hope you're having a better day than it wins yeah, it tomorrow. I hope so. Enjoy being with you today, everybody. Taking the yard over, I'm going to put a few horses with him. And basically, he's going to be um, there as a salesman. You know, he keeps the owners amused. And he's had a tremendous run. He's had about a dozen winners in the last three weeks, going really well. And uh, good news for him. But he's a cracking good trainer. We laugh oh, and have a joke with him. But I'll that's the what, one image. Good. When the money's down, he's brilliant. Yeah. No, no, he's, he's a great lad. If yeah. I could afford to have a horse, I'd have a horse with him. Um, talk, <laughs> <laughs> talking I'm not about. Sure he wants that. But going on to today's racing, a lot of punters will take the easy way out. Go for Frankie Dottori in the first two Ace of Trumps and Ace of those two win, of course, there'll be lots of running up bets. But why isn't he riding Kissagram, which is the obvious choice of the 340? Well, it says to Charlie Forkus of the Mirror that Luca Kamani asked him to ride Kissagram, but Frankie was committed to Godolphin. When their horse dropped out, Luca Kamani had booked John Reed, so we were left high and dry, said Frankie's agent, Matty Cowan. So that's why he's not on it. But, as Claude Duval says, with um, John Reed as the, as the rider, Claude Duval says that maybe Jimmy Fortune will be taking over from John Reed and Manton. And next year, Sankson, Robert Sankson doesn't like to sack his jockeys, but a Manton insider says, one day JR will be shot, he can't go on forever, and Jimmy Fortch is riding out of his skin at present. So it looks as though that we're going to lose um, John Reed to um, Jimmy Fortune for Robert Sankster. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. I think what you would say, John Reed's the sort of jockey, he won't have any problem picking up spare rides. He's a great, I must well, say, I, would back I shouldn't think for a moment there's any truth in it. No. I would back any things. horse that John Reed was riding, I'd have Absolutely. no trouble. No Absolutely. Always in the right place. Absolutely. Oh, there you go, it's got a bit of a voice in it. <laughs> <laughs> Not like John Reed, you won't go far wrong. <laughs> I must be too easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly he starts to pick up on the trainers when he's starting to uh, own a horse. He's too frightened to say anything, and then the trainer sort of says, well, well, I think maybe we should try putting it into the stalls backwards this week. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good, good idea, but now it's nice to sort of make suggestions. John Reed, I notice he normally rides for George Ward um, in the, yeah. uh, the first race, so it's conditions race 235 here, and uh, he's gone on to Stouty's horse today, so we'll see. Very interesting. That's before Channel 4 covers it, but it'll be very interesting to see what happens there. So, which trainers do you in do you with an impersonation of? I haven't, I haven't. Oh, oh it's Michael Stout. <laughs> He's got a very nice. <laughs> I, w I would do back a stab there, cover the camera with you, because he's, um, he's got a very slight sort of. Um, he'll, he's going to kill me for this. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond the phone, what the hell were you doing earlier? And you forgot the sir as well. And I forgot the sir. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I forgot the sir. And uh, Tom, there's Tomo. <laughs> I was talking to uh, Queen Mother. She said, hey, Tomo. <laughs> that awesome. Tomo is a brilliant singer, do you know? No. You know, he's, he's a brilliant well. singer, Tommy, yeah.
Just has trouble with top C's, though. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Talking to a jockey, and he yeah, eats exactly up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have fun here, don't we? <laughs> so can you phone Lady Harris up and pretend to be somebody else? I'm not sure she's uh, not the type who appreciates I, that sort of thing. I, yeah, well, no, she loves it. I do phone and pretend to be Colin something. Hello, hello. Uh, what's, uh, what's the Colin Cowdery? Hello, hello. How, how's it all going? We've caught her once, and uh, she's also got a stable uh, guy called Dan Donovan. And occasionally you ring up. Yeah, they come from the house with escape. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you're eating a lot of petunias. I don't know if it's good for you or not. <laughs> no, he's as great fun as that. So. <laughs> and, uh, you can do all sorts of things. I mean, we'll ring up as Mac one day. Are we running Croco Rouge or not? <laughs> there is the bookies who put Stravinsky at four to one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very fortunate with uh, who we have at Sandown today, but there's plenty of other places you can go racing if you can't come here. Seven meetings up and down the country today. So, obviously, we're here at Sandown for Variety Club Day. They're on the flats at Chester this afternoon, and also they're at Ripon this afternoon. They're over the jumps at Perth, and this evening there's jumping at Market Raisin, and there's flat racing at Wolverhampton and Lingfield. So no shortage of places to get out and go and see the horses today. Well, it is Variety Club Day here at Sandown, and, well, it wouldn't be the same without racing's biggest personality and biggest smile. Frankie Tutori's here. He's got rides in three of our four live races this afternoon on four. And he'll be teaming up in our first live race with a fancied horse. Let's look at that race now. That is the Pob Joy Mint Rated Stakes Handicap. It's at five past three. Seven runners take on the five furlongs, and Frankie is aboard JMP, the two-to-one favourite. Kotashi Castle and Crowded Avenue are on seven-to-two. Kilcullen Lad, nine-to-two. And it's twelve-to-one bar those. Of course, Frankie had a terrific success on Lock Angel in the Nunthorpe earlier this week, and he joins forces again with trainer Ian Balding on JNP, as he did when winning at Newmarket in May. Pass or two, furlong marker, far side, and that's uh, Thatcherella clear by three. Two in the yellow sleeve, the horse with the noseband, JMP picking up. Here comes Tyler and Goheva Golf. The stand side headed by Stuffed, who's come through. Sir Joey with a flourish. They're inside the final furlong now, and Thatcherella flat to the boards. Here comes JMP with a run. Send Uriel from the back. It's going to be close. JMP on the stand side to Joe. It's going to be very close, but JMP, JMP the winner, Sir Joey second. Yeah, really decent horse, JNP. Looked to be coming back to his best at uh, Newbury last weekend. He's a hold-up horse, and he's coming out of um, stall seven normally, you know, in a sprint. You'd, although it favours the high numbers, you'd say that maybe, uh, you know, get a bit of trouble in running. Um, but with so few runners, you've got Cortesia Castle, who's actually a decent three-year-old mm. of um, Brian Meehan's. He'll probably come from store four, come across, give him a little bit of a lead. That unusual incidence, there'll be plenty of pace, won't yeah, there? Yeah, he ought to. Um, he ought to have the race run to suit him, and he's run off a much higher mark than he runs off today. And you know, you you can't overlook the fact that the inter horses are in good form. Yeah, yeah. but they're brilliant. Particularly the sprinters, I mean, crap yeah. form at uh, in the Nunthorpe, the other third as well, didn't he? In yeah, the but there's the, you know, there, there's three or four horses in good form. Old Crated Avenue, he was off for a long time, came back. Um, the other day ran just behind JMP at He's Newbury. another one to come late. Yeah, um, and Kilcullen Lad didn't have any sort of a chance in the Stewards Cup. I think he was drawn five or something. But prior to that, there was a very good horse called A-Fan, and he chased him up. So he's got it on his plate, but strictly on the pick of his form, he's got every chance. Yeah. Your tip, though? I'd take right. JMP, yeah. Sorry, You're yours. going for it as well? Yeah, well, JMP, I think Kortaki Castle the, the, is the threat there. But uh, that'd be a good deal forecast, wouldn't it? Kotaki Castle and, and JMP. We have Actually trouble just picking one out. Hunter. Never mind. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Frankie was so he was so good this week on on uh, Loch Angel. I mean, he's, he's, he was great. And a lot of win for Ian Baldy. You won that. All very good. Yeah, bacon, two toasts and three rolls for table two. Eh? <laughs> he's winning. He promised to ride for me one day. He said, "Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do a deal." We're just sorting out the, the, the actual details of the, uh, the retaining contract. Yeah. He's gonna, I think he's going to get a, a Vectra, <laughs> and, and this and Micra. Uh, but yeah, well, J&P in the first. Cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Sorry, so we've gone, we've gone for J&P. Yeah, J&P for one. me, yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, that's probably put the mockers on that. And in fact, uh, talking of cars, our second race is the Ford 25 Years Celebration Atlanta Stakes. Listed race this for fillies and mares, and it's over a mile. Sadly, as we've already heard, just four runners in this, but they are headed there by Kissagram. And interestingly enough, uh, trainer of Kissagram, Luca Kamani, won this last year with One So Wonderful, and what a good week she had. That's the 9-4 on favourite. 
Super Cal 9 to 4, David Ellsworth's brother, Akarita on 8, and Signs and Wonders. Well, I'm sure Charles Pfizer hasn't sent it here for the fourth place prize money, but it's a 50 to 1 shot at the moment. Kissagram, boys. Well, Kissagram's boys. I mean, yeah, don't, don't restrict it to the horse, please. <laughs> yeah, he ran well at Goodwood. That's the last time I saw him. He was. Uh, huh. <laughs> I'm just going to come out with a load of nonsense. I'm going to sit here. Yeah. I'm gonna sit here. Yeah. I'm gonna she must no, no, I meant, I meant the other one. I bet no, she's been showing you the wrong horse. I'll be found <laughs> out now. No, I'll be sitting here saying, no, well, oh, yeah, well, clearly I think the horse, you know, he, he likes to cut in the ground. I think he needs, needs to run. I think he'll get the trip. And uh, obviously down in the weights, and somebody says, what does that mean? I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> they tell me that, yeah. Okay, no, uh, kiss the and saw her. Thank you very much. <laughs> at, uh, at Goodwood and ran very well there. Yeah, no, I mean, she wouldn't be in the same league as um, One So Wonderful, though she's from the same family. But she'd come back to a mile, and um, I think trainers like to win the same sort of races when they've got a you know, filly that they think is progressing. Um, Super Cow. It's going to be tactical, isn't it? There's not a lot of uh, four runners. Yeah, I mean, Super Cow's a filly I like, but she's, we saw her run at Lingfield um, earlier, early part of the season, over seven furlongs. And David. Um, El took me to task because I said she's quite a sort of tall, leggy filly, and I still stand by that. I think he's a little bit like Rory, you know, not sure what he's got to looking round, the, <laughs> looking, <laughs> looking round the yard. But I think you're not going to come on right. again, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to be she, gelded next time. Yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's confused you all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've been able to do some female impressions. <laughs> well, now you've got yeah. quite a high voice, show, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not, you know, is it a two-horse race? I mean, it's, no, it's no, difficult. They're, the they're still putting Akarita in at 8-1, but I mean... Yeah, but she, no, she's not without a chance either. She's got, um, she's got good bits of form. She ought to, you know, take a chance. And, you know, you, you naturally think, oh, one so wonderful last year, is this as good? You know, the form doesn't say she is. No, no, I mean, could progress, obviously. The, the difficulty when I said about him being tactical, just the forerunners, they could just crawl early on unless, I mean, maybe they'll make, yeah. you know, maybe Charles Sizer will seize the day and go on and set a decent pace, but yeah, it's always but, tricky, isn't it? But she ran a mile and a quarter at Goodwood last time. She wouldn't be the fastest filly in the world. You know, she's com coming back to a mile this afternoon. So, um, I mean, it's, I wouldn't want to stand in the ring and be later, but having said that, I wouldn't be surprised if Supercal, normally they hold her up at Brandy, I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised to see him change yeah. tactics this afternoon, but make the running with her. Going with Lucas Filly as a tip? Um, no, because no. I like Supercal, I'm going right. to stick with her. Rory? Kiss a grab on that one. Yeah, I'm afraid. Them. I'm afraid yeah. me too. But uh, one thing's for sure, all four of them will be in the money because there's prize money down to fourth place now of Max. Very, very quiet betting. You put on moderate racing on a Saturday. You don't get the punters interested. Labrooks report a bit of money in the 4.10. The Steamroller Stanley, they've gone 14 to 1. Hills are only going 10 to 1. They've cut it to 10 to 1 in the credit with Ladbrokes. We will be, be able to get 14 to 1 until 10.15. That race, the 4.10, the last 13 favourites have been beaten. And in the 3.05, put in favourite 2 to 1, J&P. Well